you have the lift produced by the wings. Um, that lift, if you're flying nice and steady, is balancing the weight of your of your aircraft, right? Um, and as you're flying forward, it means that you have enough thrust coming from the engine to at least be equal to to the drag that your aircraft is is experiencing the the lift effect and that that though you know it, it's linked to to the role uh, of, of aerodynamics um, definitely so first of all and even if you're talking about rotor craft so typically helicopters their blades have exactly the effect of a wing so creating that marvelous vertical towards oriented force which is called lift um so thank you so much to oscar stories for being the early backers of the pod oscar stories is a platform that offers personalized bedtime stories for kids the stories are generated using AI technology based on user input, resulting in an infinite universe of storytelling possibilities. The app is child-friendly and safe to use, available in multiple languages and offers valuable educational content. With Oscar Stories, you can create personalized audio stories with pleasant, soothing voices that stimulate the imagination and make falling asleep pleasure. You can even in- embark on adventures in the world of classic tales like Alice in Wonderland or Mombi. Oscar Stories is a great way to make bedtime storytelling enjoyable for both parents and children. Check it out at oscarstories.com today. Enjoy. Hey Gradia, how are you? I hope you're doing well. Hey Advik, hi. Yes, I'm very, very happy to be here today. Thanks for having me on your podcast. So I think let's just get into it. So before before we get into cool things that fly, uh, what was your third word after you were born? Yes, indeed, my 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 mother uh, told me that um, my first word. So I I'm, I was born in Italy, right? So my first word was mama, which means mother. My second word was papa, which in Italian can be both father and food and the third word apparently was aeroplano so i was very attracted to things that fly since a very very tender age so the, why really why, why, why do you really like planes That's really I don't like airplanes. nobody really knows nobody really knows um I have always been very attracted by objects in the sky. And so my, my, my father used to read me stories, uh, before I would go to sleep about great explorers, adventures, and also aviators. And, you know, being born in Milano, the city where Leonardo da Vinci, the great Leonardo, um, did spend a lot of time. We uh, were often going every year. We would go to the Museum of, of Science and Technology and we would see all his wonderful machine. We would see the collection of airplanes. And so it was something which, um, you know, I always had a curiosity for. And um, at some point in time, I even wanted to be a fighter pilot but at that time in Italy it was not allowed for women to fly in the Italian Air Force and so I decided well if I cannot fly these airplanes I will build them and so that's what prompted me to go to engineering school and that's what I did so I am um, an aerospace engineer and um, I'm specialized in, in aerodynamics, but I have worked most of my years on, on the structure side of, uh, of aircraft. And um, also worked in, in satellites uh, in space for 
for a short uh, period. I would say the majority of my professional journey has been in building airplanes. And um, since two years, I I moved to the Rolls Royce, uh, where it's no longer the airplane, but it's the engine, which is the most fundamental system on board um, an aircraft. Oh yeah, there's so much to learn in this one hour. I, I can't fathom it. Uh, all right, so you, you talked about uh, you were always fascinated by, and we all are. Uh, deep down in a heart by things that fly in the sky. What are the, the different things that fly in the sky? The different cool things that fly in the sky? The different cool things that can fly. So there are um, different uh, categories of of of, uh, of vehicles, right? So um, like airplanes, for instance, um, we talk about rotorcraft to indicate, for instance, um, uh, helicopters, right? Um, you can have then gliders, you know, which look like airplanes but have no motors. You can have lighter than air being, you know, air balloons uh, or airships, etc. So there's, there's more categories, but I would say the major ones are the ones of an airplane and of a rotor. Um, interestingly enough, um, satellites fly. So, in 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 engineering jargon, when when an, when a satellite is launched and then goes on to their final destination orbit and and orbit around the Earth, you also say that the satellite is flying around the Earth, even if you know up there, it's not really. It's not really flying. <laughs> the air in, is is so thin, you know. Um, the, the, there is no no lift or a very very limited amount of of lift keeping keeping the satellite afloat. So within the let's say uh, atmosphere and partially in the stratosphere, we talk about airplanes mainly and rotorcraft. What is the aircraft really doing in space if it's not flying? Well, an an aircraft can can float in the air only by yeah. constantly moving forward, um, yeah. relatively to the air, right? Yeah. So that the wings can generate that fantastic force. Uh, pointing upwards, which is called lift. Now, yeah. as you go up in altitude, the air becomes thinner and and thinner, right? So to stay afloat, the airplane needs to go even faster, right? So yeah. at a very high speed, the there is a force called the Kepler force. It's a centrifugal force, which contributes to having um, an object staying afloat, right? And this is exactly that virtual force which keeps the satellites in circular orbit, even if there is virtually no lift. So. When the altitude increases, the air density decreases, and the speed to generate enough lift, um, the speed increases as well until it becomes so high that that centrifugal force contribution becomes significant. And if you are high enough, far enough from the Earth, um, that centrifugal force will will be stronger, will dominate uh, over the the lift force, and so the aircraft would become an orbiting kind of spacecraft instead of of an aircraft supported by 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 the lift. And th there is one line, theoretical line, which separates 
um, the atmosphere from outer space, right? And that is called the yeah. Karman line. It's, it's again, symbolic. It doesn't exist really, but it's a convention that some use. It's um, 100 kilometers above the Nebel, and that's considered not universally, but by many, it's considered like the boundary of space. So and that's think... where you have that centrifugal force taking over, you know, with respect to this. But at what point does really the centrifugal uh, force take over? Um, it's, it, it's, let's say, typically above, above uh, that kind of edge of space, you, yeah. you have to have a speed um, high enough to again keep you afloat meaning you are basically orbiting right so just um for your um as, as a rule of a thumb right so airplanes normally fly in the troposphere which is up to let's say 20 kilometers more or less okay um if you think about balloons, weather balloons, for instance, they they can go in the stratosphere. And there's also some other uh, exceptional uh, platforms which can fly in the stratosphere. Like, you know, um, um, high altitude pseudo satellite or HAPS. I don't know if you've yeah. ever heard of these, like the Zephyr kind of... Um, that's up to 50 kilometers more or less, right? So um, that's the stratosphere. Then up to 85 kilometers is the mesosphere. And then you have more or less at 100 kilometers, the, the, this Karman line above which you have, for instance, in the, um, in the thermosphere, you have, for instance, the International Space Station. Um, orbiting at around 400 kilometers. So that's more or less the structure of, uh, of uh, yes, the different uh, layers between, again, uh, space, outer, outer space, and uh, Earth atmosphere, which indeed is quite uh, difficult to escape. So uh, one thing that really comes to mind, um, even though there there are these different layers, is it tough? Is it tougher to build objects that fly closer to the Earth or that are away or farther from the? Earth? It's very um, different principles, design principles. Um, one thing that you know, I was coming from building airplanes and went working on satellites. And one thing which surprised me very much, um, one thing I was not used to thinking is that, you know, satellites need to be first time right, first time perfect. And then, so you need to build them so that they resist incredible vibrations and accelerations during the launch phase. Then, so they ride on a rocket they are released by the rocket. They very often need to travel some space before they yep. reach their destination orbit. In all this, you know, you need to deploy like the solar arrays, all the different antennas, etc. And the propulsion needs to work to make sure it's the right orientation or it's traveling in the right direction to go on the final destination orbit. And all this needs to work impeccably. So first time right, first time perfect, right? And then the satellite stays in orbit and needs to work for decades, for many, many years. And you, you can't maintain, you can't do maintenance on a satellite. Yeah. You can't pull it down and then put it back up, right? So, whereas air, you know, you need to refuel them, um, 
they land at some point. And so you can use the landing to, uh, to adjust what is not working perfectly. Right. So satellites need to, uh, indeed, um, sustain very strong vibrations and accelerations during launch. And then when they're in orbit, very often the, the, the temperature excursion can be of several hundreds of degrees Celsius because yeah. we always have the sun side, which is extremely hot. And when they're flying, orbiting around the earth in the darkness, it can go absolutely very, very below zero degrees Celsius. So um, it's, um, it, it's a very unique set of challenges and requirements. You, you have to uh, dimension your, your spacecraft for, um, or typically airplane, it's, it's not a walk in the park. <laughs> either, uh, but there's, there's different types of requirements depending on what kind of aircraft are you, are you designing, right? Are you doing it for transport? Are you do it for, um, utility? Is it to do aerobatics? Uh, you know, you, you really need to know, is it a transport aircraft, a passenger aircraft? You have to have the mission in mind and then the requirements are derived by by the mission. You you you're interested in uh, what I've heard is you like companies that clean space debris. Uh, why? Um, space debris is is a big big topic because um, it's uh, um. Again, we spoke about the speed, right, of yep. uh, of, uh, of elements um, in 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 space. Basically, yep. uh, if there's debris circulating, so orbiting around the Earth, it 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 has speeds much higher than a bullet. Okay, so you can imagine that. Uh, either for the International Space Station or for satellite up there, or even, you know, for exoplanetary missions, it's extremely dangerous to potentially be hit by some debris. So currently, well, space is still pretty much empty, okay? And all degree, all debris of the order of magnitude of 10 centimeters are identified and monitored. So what happens if you're a satellite and you're, you, you are operating a satellite and you see that it will be on the trajectory of, of, a, of, of a piece of debris? you can do an avoidance maneuver, right? So with, with the propulsion on board a satellite, you can move it slightly so that it will not collide with the debris. But um, it has happened that satellites exploded or the satellite collided and they created some cloud of debris, right? Which are extremely dangerous. So for the time being, we can monitor debris and do some diversive maneuvers to avoid hitting. But of course you can imagine now with the satellite constellations up there, more and more satellites orbiting, um, you know, potentially the, 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 the level of debris will increase uh, remarkably. So, I think it's a very, um, absolutely, it's, it's a mission which will need to be, um, uh, the a type of mission will, which will definitely become more and more relevant. The idea, not only to avoid debris, but also to um, lean, collect it so that it doesn't become a hazard. 
Yeah, for sure, definitely. I, I think we'll get back to point there. We got a little farther from Earth there, but I think we'll come back to uh, ground. Uh, so, you, um, like you said, with satellites, you have the mission set, you know what you want to make. What happens after that? Um... Well, once you have a mission, are you, are you talking about an aircraft or satellites? Aircraft, we need satellite. Aircraft. Okay, so there is one, um, so airplane. Let's talk about airplane. Um, there is one principle which is fundamental, no matter, are, are you doing a glider, are you building a small airplane, a big airplane, a propeller or jet airplane, there is one fundamental principle which all flying objects need to take into consideration, and that is called airworthiness, right? It's strongly linked with safety. In our industry, in the aerospace industry, safety comes first always, that's the dogma. And airworthiness of an aircraft is basically um, the aptitude uh, of an aircraft to be able to fly in all conditions, in all the conditions for which it has been des designed, basically, in a safe manner, right? So why is it so important to always keep in mind airworthiness and the certification of aircraft because um, you can just build an aircraft and fly it without having uh, the permission to do so. There are different um, bodies, so aviation authorities, which differ depending in which country you are, but there are some, there's good correlation between what's going on in the single countries, and ICAO, which is the overarching um, regulatory body of, of aviation. So there are some, some certification rules you need, to, you need to comply with. You need to be able to demonstrate that what you are building is absolutely safe and that nobody and no one will be harmed when that um, um, uh, airplane uh, goes into our aircraft, goes into operation. So that is absolutely the, once you, you decide what is it that you want to build, you need to make yourself familiar with the certification rules you need to respect. And in case you want to build something which doesn't exist yet, it could be that there are no rules yet. <laughs> Just think about, for instance, urban air mobility, right? Or um, electrical VTOLs, eVTOLs. Um, of course, there, there are none in operation yet. Meaning all the companies developing UAM are really conversant with uh, the aviation authorities um, like, for instance, Joby is talking to FAA in the United States. You have, um, for instance, um, Vertical in UK talking to the CAA, that's the, the British Certification Authority. Volocopter in Germany, they talk to EASA, that's the European Certification Authority. So that together um, they can really see what do we need to do to demonstrate that these aircraft are are safe. So if it doesn't exist yet, it doesn't mean that you can't do it. You just need to make sure, again, that, um, that you work hand in hand with the certification authorities to make sure that at the end your, your aircraft can fly. So once you have that kind of, of framework, well, you need to, you will already have done your analysis. Um, you will have checked um, what does the market need? What type of requirements does my aircraft need to um, respond to? Um, 
very, very often there's a lot of iterations when when you design uh, an aircraft and there's also a lot of trades trade-off studies you you need to you need to do right um so you will have to decide what kind of technologies you want to have on board what kind of um structural concept do you want to um you want to have you want to design what is the system architecture. So you will have systems on board, an electrical system probably. Um, when you have air, you, you will have an hydraulic system. So how do you design that? And um, and then, yes, you, you very often in parallel to that also simulate, of course, the, the characteristics of, of, your, of your product. It's much um, it's it's intelligent to to simulate rather than build and test and then it doesn't work and you've lost you've lost time and and money right so um, you do this preliminary sizing with a lot of iterations and trade off between you know um, different uh, different parameters and then when you're pretty sure you've nailed it you go into the detail. Um, design phase where you really um, define and dimension all the parts, um, all the interfaces. You decide what kind of equipment you're going to have on board, the engines, um, the the landing gear. These are the big uh, components, you know, which which at this stage in the design phase are are then um, indeed. Um, decided and, and defined as the word says. Um, then you start the, the, the production, the assembly. Normally the first aircraft you you build will not fly, but will be used. I'm talking now about big, big jets, right? So typically passenger air, airplanes, right? The first you build don't fly. They're used for testing. So you can you test the structure um, for uh, you apply loads. You can see um, what the behavior of the structure is under under load. You simulate some flying cycles to make sure that it can fly not only once but for many many years for all its life. And um, and yes, so. Testing is is a big big part, of course, of uh, of qualifying uh, an aircraft. Um, and uh, after you do all the tests on the ground, both at structural level and at system level, then finally you you're clear to fly. You have your first flight, and then um, you basically. Throughout all these phases, what you want to check is that the aircraft behaves in the way you had predicted. You had predict, predicted it, right? Uh, and sometimes it's even it's even better than than what you have um, predicted. And if it's not better, you need to iterate. So there are changes you introduce to make sure. That at the end, what um, gets certified and goes out to the customers is really um, satisfying the the requirements which you had set at the very at the very beginning. Um, and during this testing phase, you also test some pretty scary stuff, which is absolutely necessary to again give evidence to the. Um, authorities that uh, no matter what happens your your airplane is or aircraft is is safe right so uh, typically you will shoot birds with a bird cannon against your aircraft to show that you know in the unlikely event of hitting a bird while you're flying you can still get home safely um, you'll um you have to fly um, your your aircraft in very very cold weather conditions or in very very hot 
um, conditions just to test, you know, the extremes of, uh, of, of the weather. You even have to go and look for thunderstorms and get hit by thunders to demonstrate that uh, you have built your aircraft in a way that, you know, um, electricity flows, the charge flows through the structure and there is no, um, no, no big damage that you can land again, you can get home safely. So yes, it's a very, very extensive um, testing, testing uh, program um, to try and capture all what is expected during the, the life of, uh, of the aircraft. Uh, including all possible uh, things which which can go wrong, right? So it's um, it's a very it's a very long process going through through all these phases. Uh, plus, uh, again, the the testing it can take you know up to ten years from the very the first time you pick up the pencil. Uh, to, to, yes, entering um, into into some. Yeah, that that that's what you need to make cool flying machines. Uh, but how how do you really go about before getting the like before becoming airworthy? How do you really design the flying object? Or the, I'll stop referring it to a flying object, but aircraft. It, it depends a lot from um, yeah. what you wanted to do, right? Yeah. So um, normally, and again, I'm talking about what do big companies do, like, you know, like Airbus, like, like Boeing. Um, it all starts with what's the purpose of, of the aircraft you want to, um, you want to build. Uh, are you gonna design it to carry passengers and and cargo? Uh, is it going to be for very short routes or for longer ones? Um, of course, we're talking about commercial aircraft, right? If you would want to design a fighter jet, it's a completely different mission, right? Because then you don't care about um, typically. Um, fuel efficiency, but you will want to fly very fast. So it will need to have a very good maneuverability at very high speed, for instance, right? Um, there's planes uh, able to land on water. Is that what you're going to be designing? Or, you know, um, uh, is, is it going to be an amphibious um, airplane? So you need to first really focus on what the purpose, what the mission of your of your airplane or aircraft will be, and very often, so in in big companies again, you study the market very very um, carefully. There's full teams doing exactly that to understand um, is there a gap in the market. Um, where you know we could position a product um which then could be could be successful so you need the market requirement of course you always keep an eye on the competition what are what is the competition doing um you will normally make very early also an estimation of your budget um and typically if you are in competition with someone else, you will want your aircraft to consume less, um, to be more uh, performant and, um, you know, very efficient uh, without, uh, without compromising performance with a whole new bunch of cool um, technologies, for instance, right? Um, now, one thing which is absolutely becoming more and and more um, relevant is is the environmental factor, right? As we know that air traffic 
is is increasing. Uh, the trend before COVID was was exponential, and I think we're getting back to that. So um, having more and more aircraft flying means more and more emissions, and emissions can be uh, of different nature. Noise is also an emission, right? Um, so noise pollution, um, you have cities becoming bigger and bigger and homes getting closer and closer to airports. So noise becomes um, a more and more critical mm, factor. Um, then, of course, you have emissions like um, CO2, carbon dioxide. Um, um, you have SO2, sulfur dioxide. Um, you have different um, oxide, NOx, NOx nitrates, different matter. You have um, non, um, you have particulate, particulate, non volatile particulate uh, matter. So, all due to the fact that you have some unburdened parts of, of, your, of your fuel. So, it's, uh, and there's more and more, of course, focus on emissions in every industry. And uh, definitely, aviation um, is also playing its part in committing to reach net zero as a whole by 2050. So there's a lot of attention uh, in terms of becoming more and more sustainable from the emissions perspective, but also from the materials perspective to make sure that the materials you use uh, can be can be recycled, for instance. So it's um, it's really um, the environmental factor is likely to be a very strong one. Yeah, definitely. Uh, so, w when you design the aircrafts, you do keep the environmental factor in mind that I think they um, they should mandate it, but I don't think they have. Uh, when you really design these flying objects, <laughs> these aircrafts, what what is something that is to a certain extent common in most of them? Is it the aerodynamics or something else, something like that? Um, well, uh, the, I would say the thing, um, in common across all aircraft are the laws of physics. This is the really something you can, you can rely on. <laughs> yeah. Um, and specifically, um, I would say the, the, the lift effect and that that though you know it, it's linked to to the role uh, of, of aerodynamics um, definitely so first of all I I think it's important to to be clear in terms of the difference between the role of an engine and the role of of a wing yeah. Um, and even if you're talking about rotor crafts, so typically helicopters, their blades have exactly the effect of a wing. So creating that marvelous vertical force oriented force, which is called lift. Um, so the, the engines are basically designed to produce thrust. So to move forward to move an aircraft forward at high speed right so um that speed makes the air flow over the wings right so the airflow needs to avoid the 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 wing and that kind of airflow Throws the air downward towards the ground, generating an upward force called lift, overcoming at the end the weight of the plane and holding it in, in the sky. So basically, the engines move, move a plane forward. The wings move it 
upward, really not scientifically accurate, right? Um, yeah. So, yes, it it's all about making sure that you have a, a balanced situation. If you see like a big jet cruising through the sky, you know, in, in steady in steady flight, um, in that configuration, you have a very nice balance of of different forces, which you can consider applied to the center of gravity, right? So you have the lift produced by the wings. Um, that lift, if you're flying nice and steady, is balancing the weight of your of your aircraft, right? Um, and, um, that's, that's what, what keeps the, the, the airplane in, in, in the air. And as you're flying forward, it means that you have enough thrust coming from the engine to at least be equal to, to the drag that your aircraft is, is experiencing. So it's all a matter of of balancing these, um, these, these, these forces. Now, the way the role of aerodynamics and the generation of, of lift, well, that's, that's a bit more complicated than, than I have very simply articulated it. I don't know if you've ever done this. Hopefully you've done this safely. Um, you know, if you're in a car and you kind of stick your hand out, your palm is is down, right? And and you you just then angle your 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 hand a little bit at the front, so that the wind catches the underside of the hand, right? Um, you you can clearly feel the the lift force, right? So the um, the air hitting the bottom of your hand is is deflected downward and and in in again according to the laws of, of physics the third law uh, of of Newton action reaction um, the the flow is is deflected downwards and your hand is being pushed um, upwards now the the wing shape is a fundamental component of all of all this, right? So if you imagine cutting a wing, um, you you will see a typical. Uh, it looks like a bit of a fish shape, right? That's that's the the airfoil, and which has a curved edge. Very important because airflow likes curved surfaces. Um, the airflow tends to follow the the curved um, the curved uh, surface. There's, you know, a very nice experiment you you can do of having um, a candle behind like um, a wooden plate, and you blow, and of course the candle doesn't, uh, you know, is still is still burning. But if you have a round object and you have a curved object, cylindrical object, and you put your candle behind it and you you blow, then the candle goes out, right? So that's why, because the flow likes to attach itself to the to the curved um, surface, right? And and that's what happens. Um, with 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 a wing, with the wing, right? So the air encounters this leading edge, um, and when attach itself on 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 the upper surface and bend around and uh, and follow that angle very very um, very nicely, right? So um, and at the end you have um, a. a a low pressure area above, high pressure area below, and the difference between the two gives gives lift, right? So that's the the magic of uh, 
of uh, of of lift. So the the law law of physics govern everything. Yeah. Um, the same as with uh, aircraft, school flying objects, no matter what you do. Uh, but you design uh, the 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 way in which we are talking about it's a lot more complicated than that. I can feel it, but uh. Just in layman terms, uh, what are like the different things you talked about? Engines and wings, which are, uh, I'm guessing, the two most important things in an aircraft, like a airplane. Uh, what is propulsion, propulsion, and things that really make it lift and make it fly and make it keep it in there? So, um, as we said, so the, the wings are mainly responsible for creating the lift, right? The engines are mainly responsible for creating the thrust. Now, yeah. um, engines are absolutely an incredibly complex piece of equipment. Uh, and, you know, you will have felt it flying in an airplane, you know, at takeoff, you're still on the runway, your aircraft is speeding down and, and, and you are like pushed back in, in your seat, right? So that yeah. absolutely what, you know, a, a modern jet engine, um, is, is doing beneath each wing, like inhaling the air, accelerating it, yeah. um, uh, out the back and producing and producing the, the thrust. Now the details. There's there's mainly three companies doing these big big jet engines, turbofan engines. You have General Electric, Rolls Royce, and Pratt and Whitney. So some details change, but again, the physics, the thermodynamics, the basics of what's happening is is absolutely the the same. Also here, guess what? Newton's third law. Every action has an equal and opposite reaction. This is common to every single jet engine. So it sounds simple, but it again, so, so, so complex and incredibly fascinating what's going on inside an engine. Now, if you want to remember very easily the faintness of, you know, the stages, what's going on within an engine. You just have to remember, suck, squeeze, bang, blow. Suck in the air, you squeeze it through the compressor, bang through the, com the combustion chamber, and then it's, you blow it out. So indeed, those big fans that you see at, you know, when, when you look at an engine, you see the fan. And yeah. this is... Um, these these blades can be absolutely enormous. It can be like more than ten feet in, in, in diameter. That's that's the fat, right? That's what inhales inhales the the air, um, right? So they can suck in um, even you know more than almost four thousand pounds of air. Per second, that's how much they can they can suck in what, during the takeoff uh, the takeoff phase, right? Um, so yeah. the, the the fan slurps in the air, and yeah. when the the air goes through the engine, and you have a relatively small amount of air that goes through the center of the machine, most of the air goes around it and and going it goes straight out the back that's called the the bypass um air right so the difference um between the part of the air that bypasses the core versus the air that goes through it is called the bypass ratio of of, of an engine and the higher it is the more efficient your engine is, right? So you want to have a lot of air going going out of your core. Now, back in the early days, the very early engines had 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 low 
uh, bypass ratio. Um, so there was not a lot of it um, going through the bypass and it was going um, very, very fast. But today the all modern um, turbofan engines have really very, very high bypass ratio. Of course, we're talking about, again, commercial aircraft. On yeah. military aircraft, it's a bit different. Um, they have other priorities, right? Um, yeah. So like being very, very maneuverable, um, sometimes go supersonic. And, and so you have features which are exclusive to military aircraft, like the burners, right? So that's, yeah. that's a different kind of design. But again, in, in, in commercial airplane, you know, you have, again, the fan sucking in the air. Um, then you have the, the part of air going through the core is, is compressed, right? So yeah. there, there is a, let's say, 10% of the air goes through the core, 90% goes outside, more, more or less. And the first part of the core is the compressor stage where the air is, um, is indeed is squeezed. So you have very dense air, you squeeze it, you squeeze it, you squeeze it. So very often the compressor has different stages with blades getting smaller and, and smaller. And it takes a whole lot of work to compress the air. The air is resisting against being compressed, right? So it's like yeah. if you're trying to push water um, uphill. Um, so you have the compressor. And after that, you have the combustor, right? So ignition, um, the air it's heat, it heats up even, even more and... Um, you know, you, you you can have a temperature of of the air at the end of the compressor going up to one thousand five hundred degrees Fahrenheit, right? And through the combustor, you could have something like three thousand degrees Fahrenheit. So that's you know, if you think of molten lava coming out of a volcano, we're talking about two thousand. 2000 degrees Fahrenheit. So the temperature inside the combustor is higher than molten lava, which is absolutely amazing because that temperature is higher than the melting point <laughs> of the turbine blades right after the, com the combustor, right? So these blades are absolutely amazing. The turbine blades have like some, some cooling channels inside them. They are not made of solid metal. Otherwise, they would melt. There are some, some air paths inside these turbines. Manufacturing them is absolutely amazing. And, um, and so you have to pump air through through the blades to prevent them from 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 melting right so you take air from the compressor um and, and and you inject it into 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 the blades and so yes it's um it's absolutely incredibly hot inside inside the engine and um yeah well you the 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 air, the air is superheated you have um you have had the combustion and then uh, before uh, you you get ejected, you have to to spin to spin turbines, right? So you have a bunch of air that's got a lot of energy, a lot of energy. You've done all that so that that energy can be released through the turbine um, stages. And there's normally um, different um, turbines with specific tasks. You have like a high pressure turbine that takes energy and spins and operates the compressor, for instance, right? Which basically runs the core and the low pressure turbine um, stages take the energy and spin the, the, the fan in the very front, the one that, that sucks in the air. 
on Rolls Royce engines, typically the Trent engines, the one powering the A350, you also have an intermediate pressure um, turbine uh, where uh, between the high and low, where um, the, the, the first to make the compressor work and the final one powers the huge uh, fan blade in the front. So basically, you know, the air going into the core is compressed. It's heated with burning fuel. It drives turbines. The turbines drive the fan blades at the front of the engine and the and the compressor. And you always need to think that it's the air going outside, which can be even 90% of the whole air sucked in by the fan, that gives the engine most of, of its thrust. So, yeah, um, the bypass air goes at lower speed than the air that goes through the core, uh, but it has a lot of, of mass. So even if it's yeah. slow, it, it generates a lot of thrust, and it's because of that thrust that uh, that uh, aircraft can move can move forward. So yeah, um, engines are absolutely very very complex. Uh, it's the most expensive part of uh, typically of, of an airplane at the point that you know sometimes you you have old airplanes being cannibalized just to have the engines um, all of them. So definitely is fundamental, fundamental parts, um, fundamental pieces of, of equipment on, on aircraft. It's the engine. Yeah. How did the uh, design, design of the engine really change with the size of the aircraft? So how is it different in a smaller aircraft versus a larger one or bigger one? It, it all depends from what the rating of of your um, of your engine is right so um, typically the engine I mentioned before the trend XWB uh, powering the 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 a350 dash 900 and the dash thousand has two variants so there is there is a variant which can produce it's the dash 84. It's 84,000 pounds of takeoff thrust. And for the Dash 1000, A350-1000, you have the even bigger um, variant, which produces 97,000 uh, pounds of, of, of thrust. So um, you size your, your, your engine depending on... Um, Again, on what the maximum takeoff weight of of your 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 aircraft is. I'll just ask one question to end with. I've been into startups and everything I'm doing right now since I was eleven. What do you think is one fact that you think will blow eleven year old me mind? Oh, um, teleportation. Okay. Once we will be able to. Well, um, yeah, once we will, the problem is the protons, right? It, the mass transporting, um, virtually mass is, is a bit complicated, but you know, maybe one day teleportation will become a reality and then, um, we will make, uh, ourselves as engine and airplane manufacturers redundant. Yeah, definitely. That, that blew 15 year old me mind, uh, so there been incredible uh, I think that's it from my say, thing you'd like to say well thank you very much for the chat that week and uh, yes I'm looking forward to uh, listening to other um, super interesting podcasts of your revamped founder edition thank you thank you